morning is an exciting moment to be celebrating Jesus' birth and the kids singing. I remember when I used to do kids' plays. Did, you, did anybody else do kids' plays before? A little kid, they got like that blind, you got to memorize songs, you got to practice, or they used to, there's like some, sometimes one of them, we got to dress up in our PJs for the occasion. I was like, awesome, I'm wearing my PJs at church. Um, but yeah, then we had, we did this one, we did this one kids' program called, what was it called, Candy Cane, oh, Candy Cane Lane. Lane, and then Dad got to dress up, Pastor got to dress up too, he was a big baby. <laughs> <laughs> that was really fun. So, um, anyway, well, this morning we're gonna we're gonna open the word, and I I pray I've been praying that we would hear from hear from God that His word would penetrate our hearts, would encourage us, and that uh, we would look look to Him and, and see Him in a whole new way. Kind of like me just be throwing pastors in the show. No, being a baby, but no. Uh, so let's let's pray so we can go into the Word and we can receive from Him this morning. Father, we are so grateful that we can gather together as family around the Christmas season, and Lord, we're thankful for You, Jesus, that You are here with us, that You came and You dwelt among us, that You came and gave us the most amazing gift we could ever imagine in eternal life. So, Father, as we open the Word this morning, I ask that Your Holy Spirit would be present with us. I ask that uh, you would come and to speak to us, that the Holy Spirit would be here to reveal truth. So, Father, I pray that we would all receive it, Lord, with open hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. But if you will, uh, turn with me to Matthew. We're going to be reading uh, Matthew chapter 1 today, and I think it's probably the least <coughs> read portion of Scripture in uh, the Bible, probably because of all the hard pronunciation of these names. But I think to make a significant point this morning, I want to give it a shot, <coughs> and uh, I would like you guys to read along with me. So we're in Matthew chapter 1, and we're going to start in verse 1. Um, Matthew, the writer of, of the book, uh, was writing this book to a specific audience. So when each person um, was writing their portion of the Bible, they always, they always wrote it to a specific audience. Uh, they had somebody in mind. You would go through the <coughs> later books, like the Book of Corinthians and Ephesians, and other books. Can, it's pretty specific. Okay, there's that city. Uh, and then the Gospels here, Matthew. Matthew was talking specifically to the Jewish um, uh, Jewish people, and he was bringing out some significant points. Thus, why he started with the genealogy. So let's read this together, starting in verse one. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez the father of Rizam, Hizram the father of Ram, Ram the father of Aminadab, Aminadab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Solomon, Solomon the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. That's a really significant portion. We're not going to get to that story, but even the fact that Rahab is in there is really significant. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse, the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Solomon, the father of Rehoboam. And Rehoboam, the father of Ejah. Ejah, the father of Hazem. And Hazem, the father of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, the father of jo Jehoram, Jehoram the father of Jerizah, Uzziah the father of Jotham, and Jotham the father of Ahaz, Ahaz the father of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah the father of Manasseh, Manasseh the father of Ammon, and Ammon the father of Josiah, and Josiah the father <coughs> of Rephaniah, and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. After the exile of Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shaltiel, Shaltiel the father of Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel the father of Abahad, and Abahad the father of Alchem, Alchem the father of Azor, and Azor the father of Zodok, and Zodok the father of Achim, Achim the father of Elad, Elad the father of Elzar, and Elzar the father of Mahan, and Mahan the father of Jacob. 
and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. Thus there was fourteen generations in all, from Abraham to David, fourteen from David to the exile, to the Babylon, to the exile, to Babylon, and fourteen from the exile to Messiah. In verse 18, this is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother, Mary, was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quickly, or quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord has said through his prophet. The virgin will conceive and, the birth, and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until after she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. So on a Sunday morning, celebrating Christmas, why would we read the list of all these names, the genealogy of Jesus' birth? Well, this series that we've been going through is called The Pictures of Jesus. So we've started with Jesus being, having a picture of a good shepherd. He's the one that lays down his life for his sheep. He leads them advice besides quiet waters. They have nothing in want. We also talked last week about Jesus being the light. He's the one that is illuminating our path. He's the one that brings light to our soul. He's the one that, um, that we fall in love with, and if those, those of us fall in love with him, we fall in love with light and, and reject the darkness that is in the world. And this week, I was, I was thinking about Jesus and the different pictures that we see of Jesus. We see here at the, the very birth of Jesus, this picture of him being the, um, uh, in the lineage or the son of David. It says uh, here that Joseph was the son of David, and, and we know also that Jesus Throughout his ministry, different people would call out to him and call him the son of David. You remember the um, blind um, Bartimaeus, right? And when he was in the crowds, and the crowds were gathered around Jesus, and Jesus was walking by, Bartimaeus was the one that cried out to him, Son of David, have mercy on me. You guys know, remember that story? And, and Jesus took time, and, and he yelled, and everybody tried to quiet him down, but he continued to yell out to him, Son of David. There's other um, references also. To people that were were um, deaf of hearing, and they cried out to Jesus as the Son of David. We know also not only was this a title that many cried out to him and called on him, but then it was also a title that infuriated the the religious leaders. And I believe it's because they knew the prophetic significance of this title. So we know in Second um, Samuel chapter seven verses 15 and 16, there's a very significant prophecy that was given to David and his, um, and his family and his throne. So in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 15 and 16, it says, it says, My steadfast love will not be depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. And your house, this talking to David, and the prophet Samuel is talking to David, he says, And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever. There is a promise to the house of David that his kingdom would be established forever. So when the Jewish people, and when Matthew's writing to, the, to these, uh, writing this book, and he's putting in this genealogy, it was important for him to establish that Jesus was the one that was prophesied. However, it's really an interesting thing as we look at the, uh, the way the, people, the Jewish people interacted with Jesus, and they actually rejected his his throne, the throne that he established, he actually came to establish a new covenant with us. Unlike the old covenant where um, there had to be rams and, and bulls and, and sacrifice given, 
I'm actually kind of excited that this morning I didn't have to offer a sacrifice or we didn't have to have any kind of blood uh, issues here this morning so that we could uh, gather together, but we could gather freely. And that was the new covenant that Jesus established with the covenant that now we have a full relation with God apart from anything else. But this, this title of Son of David really got me thinking, what, what is significant? What is a significant picture of, of, this, of David that would give us more insight into Jesus and his kingdom and how he establishes his kingdom as the Son of David himself? So we're going to open up a, a passage in the Old Testament today, in 1 Samuel chapter 17. And I believe this is a really clear picture of how Jesus established his kingdom, how he established, how he fulfilled this title of Son of David. We see David in maybe the early parts of how he is introduced in the Bible, and this amazing story that many of us may have heard as a, as a child, or heard. I think maybe a lot of people, even in the news today, don't mention David and Goliath type situations. But I think when we read this um, passage today, we're going to see a picture of Jesus in a way that we haven't before. And I think it's going to be really impactful for us as we enter into this season of celebrating his birth. So let's look at um, 1 Samuel, and I want to read... Samuel chapter 17. First Samuel chapter 17. And you can follow along with me. I'm reading from the NIV version, so maybe if you have your phone, you can change that. That way our words are, are matching. Um, but let's read this story together. And maybe if it's a familiar story with you, uh, for you, um, I want to ask you to do something. That's something that I kind of fail to do at certain times when I'm listening to sermons or when I'm reading the Bible. Sometimes uh, as I'm listening to a familiar passage, I'll think about all the things that I know, or maybe I'll think about previous sermons that I've heard about different uh, passages that are brought. And I think all those things are valuable as we learn, as we grow, right? And, and in this moment, I want, to, I want us to look at this story as if this is the first time we've heard this story. Because sometimes we come with like preconceived ideas, things that we've heard, and say, okay, this is going to be the first time we're here. So whatever, while I'm reading, I've, I've just been praying this week that when I read this story, that people will enter into like an adventure. I, I talked about a, a while ago my kind of Barney imaginary um, uh, imagination that I was able to have. I, let's, let's kind of enter into that kind of phase of let's, let's picture ourselves here, hearing the story for the first time, imagining the picture of the whole war going on. Uh, all is a new thing this morning. So let's read uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17. Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at Sokah in Judah. They pitched their camp at Ephes, Dan, between the Soka and Ezekiah. Saul and his Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Keilah and drew up their battle lines to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another, with the valley between them. Let's see a big battle scene in my mind. One hill has a big army, another hill has an army, big green valley in between them, maybe some dust. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out to the Philistines. His height was six cubits. And a, and a span. He had a bronze helmet, and his head wore a coat of scale of armor, of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs he wore bronze greaves, and bronze javel was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a waver's rod, and his iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him, Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of the Israelites, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, he will become your subjects. Or we will become your subjects. But if I overcome them and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine said, This day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing this, the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. I think I might be in that number. 
pretty terrified a big giant comes out, huge armor, and says, hey, if you, if you can defeat me, I'm only 5'6". I, I used to play basketball a little bit. Being 5'6", I've, I've uh, run into the situation playing against people that are a foot or more taller than me. Or yesterday, I hung out with Christopher, and he reminded me how big he was compared to me. But this moment, the Israelites here are terrified at this giant. They, they don't have a man that can face this giant. Verse 12. Now David was a son of an Ephraim named Jesse, who was from Bethlehem in Judea, or Ju Judah. Jesse had eight sons, and in Saul's time, he was very old. Jesse's three oldest sons had followed Saul to war. The firstborn was Elam, the second, Abinam, and the third, Shema. David was the youngest. The three oldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to tend to his father's sheep at Bethlehem. For forty days the Philistine came forward every morning and evening and took his stand. Now Jesse said to his son David, Take this ephod of roasted grain and those ten loaves of bread from your brothers and hurry to their camp. Take along these ten cheeses to the commander to their unit. See how your brothers are and bring back some assurance from them. They are with Saul and all the men of Israel in the valley of Elah, fighting against the Philistines. Early in the morning, David left the flock in, care to, in the care of a shepherd, loaded up and set out as Jesse had directed. He reached the camp, and as the army was going out to its battle position, shouting the war cry, Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines, facing each other. David left his things with the keeper of supplies, ran to the battle lines and asked his brother how they were. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine, champion of, from God, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance, and David heard it. Whenever the Israelites saw the man, they all fled from him in great fear. Now the Israelites had been saying, Do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage, and will exempt his family from taxes in Israel. David asked the men standing near him, What will be done for the man who kills the Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Now this demonstration of, of David kind of getting righteous anger. The fact that this Philistine, Goliath, is making fun of, defying the God of Israel. They repeated to him what they had been saying and told him, This is what will be done for the man who kills him. When Elam, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the, with the men, he, buried, he burned with anger at him and asked, Why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? I know how conceited you are, and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. Now, what have you done? said David. Can't I even speak? He then turned away to someone else, and brought up the same matter. And the men answered him as before. What David said was overheard and reported to Saul, and Saul sent for him. David said to Saul, Let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight them. He's the youngest boy, shepherd boy. You know, I, I look at um, his older brother, even trying to make him seem more insignificant than he was. He was like, You're just, you just got a few sheep. You just go, go take care of those few sheep in the field. What are you doing here, little runt of a family? And he goes up before the king, and he's like, Hey, I'm the servant, I'll go, I'll do this. I got this. I got this, Saul. For those of you who thought, Saul replied in verse 33. Saul replied, You are not able to go out against the Philistine and fight. You are only a young man, and he hath been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, I struck it, and rescued the sheep from his mouth. 
When it turned on me, I seized it by the hair and struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of the Philistine. Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord will be with you. Then Saul, then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and bronze helmet in his, on his head. And David fastened his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. The little, little uh, shepherd boy gets the king's armor to go fight this giant Philistine. And again, that's a kind of funny picture off the top of my head. The moment before, Saul had just said, go, and the Lord will be with you. And he said, wait a second, let me add to you all these things. There's always like, I mean, like, he's with you, but here's some protection, here's some armor, here's my thing. I want to make sure you're going to be okay, but the Lord will be with you. I don't know how many times you guys maybe have said that even to somebody, like, encourage them. But yeah, the Lord's with you, but wait a second, what you got to do this, 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 and here's some things to help you along the way. Let's see David's reaction. He says in um, the rest of 39, I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I am not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in his pouch and the shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, he approached the Philistine. Meanwhile, the Philistine, with his shield bare in front of him, kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was a little more than a boy, glowing with a health, with glowing with health, and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, I, "Am I a dog that you could come with me with sticks?" And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. "Come here," he said, "and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals." David said to the Philistine, "You come against me with swords and spear and a javelin, but I come against you." In the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and will strike you down and cut your head. I will cut your head off. This very day I will give to her carcass of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. Verse 47 again. All those gathered here will know that it is the, not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all you into our hands. As the Philistines moved closer to the attack, David ran quickly forward to the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. David ran over, stood over him, and he took the Philistine's sword and he drew it from its sheath. After he killed him, he cut off his head with the sword. When the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and ran. Then the men of Israel and Judah surged forward with a shout, pursued the Philistines to the entrance of Gath and to the gates of Ephron. Their dead were strewn along the Shuram road in Gath, to Gath and Ephron. When the Israelites returned chasing the Philistines, they plundered their camp. David took the Philistines' head and brought it to Jerusalem. He put the Philistines' weapon in his own tent. As Saul watched David going out to meet the Philistines, he said to Abner, commander of the army, Abner, whose son is this young man? And I replied, as surely as you live, your majesty, I do not know. The king said, Find out whose son this young man is. As soon as David returned from killing the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul. 
And David still holding to the Philistine's head. Whose son are you, young man? Saul asked him. David said, I am the son of your servant Jesse of Bethlehem. I think many times I've I read this story or I've heard sermons or I've meditated on this. And so many times I view myself as this little uh, shepherd boy, this insignificant guy who's going to go out and defeat this giant that's going to face and that I'm facing. And I sometimes uh, I've even encouraged myself in this manner to think that, to think that there's there's um, that there's huge things in my life that are coming against me. And all I need to do is pick up these small insignificant stones and sling them at the giant and stand in faith and the victory of the money. But I love this story even more so now as I've been meditating on seeing Jesus in this story. That Jesus is the son of David, that he is the one that is establishing the kingdom of, of, of David. He's establishing the throne again in his in his birth, in his life, and in his resurrection. So what is this, why is this, how is this story so significant? How does this story compare to Jesus? How does it give us a better picture, a better view of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior this morning? The one who was born in a manger. I think one of the parallels that I saw while I was reading this story is the, the humble beginning. For me, it's a really significant thing to know that Jesus fully God, fully man, was born in one of the most lowly places in Jerusalem, in Bethlehem, in a manger. And when I was, uh, it wasn't until recently where I, I learned that a manger, uh, we had uh, at Purdue University, we had a lot of vet schools, they had a, a good a vet program, so we had some vet students that were involved in Chi Alpha, and they were telling us uh, what a manger really is, and I was like, you know, I, I, I knew that, and I'm like, okay, that's a little manger scene. But the manger was actually the place in which Jesus was put, which was actually like a feeding trough. So Jesus, King of the universe, the God-man, the one that sits on the right hand of God, the one that, that was there when everything was spoken into existence, the Word of God himself, was born in the most humble position ever as a baby in a manger, in a feeding trough for animals, because there was no place for him in the end. Now when I think about Jesus, I always think, I'm like, man, Jesus, you, know, you could have came as like fully man, like 30 years old, just pop out of nowhere, and just like all the miracles and everything could have been made for you. You, you just, I mean, show up as God, like put, put rockets in the sky, shoot off some fireworks, tell everybody in the world, you're God, like, come worship me. But Jesus was, came in a complete opposite way. Completely humble. Humbles himself of everything. Didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped. But he came with a baby. A humble state. And I look at, at David, who I bring up these points where his, his brother, his older brother, is telling him, hey, David, you're, you're just... Just go take care of those few sheep that you have out in the field. David is the youngest son. David, the guy that comes before King Saul, never worn armor before. He's like, all right, I, I mean, I killed a lion, I killed a bear. I mean, this Philistine guy, he's no big deal. I'm just, I'm just I'm going to go do my thing. Completely humble <coughs> beginnings. The start of his establishing, for David, the, his kingdom was one where they where the, the kingdom was at its largest when, he, when King David was at his, at, his, um, at his throne, at the pinnacle of his, his rule. And so here he starts, though, not at the pinnacle where everything is amazing, but he starts just as a, a simple shepherd boy, taking care of the sheep. He comes before the Goliath, the one that's about to, is going to defy, the one that has all of the, the champion. Uh, he's the one that actually hails his, that he's a champion Saul says, right, he's been a warrior since his youth. His humble beginnings. The second, the second thing I notice about these, this parallel is that David was not what was expected. 
right? So he came. It says with a sling and a sword. Not a, a sling instead of a sword. Saul tried to give him his armor, but he said he rejected it. This is the biggest thing when we think about Jesus also. How did Jesus establish his kingdom? Was it with a sword, or was it with armor, was it with conquering, was it with overthrowing the Roman Empire as, as they were expecting him to? So the Messiah, the, re the main reason why they rejected him as Messiah, because he didn't come in the form that he, they wanted him to. He came with a cross. He came humble. He came beaten and struck down. So when I look at this story in, in 1 Samuel uh, 17, there's another really significant moment that is in this. Like I mentioned so many times, I've identified myself and I've tried to encourage myself, I'm the David, I'm going to run out to the battle with a, with a sling and a stone, I'm going to slay the giants that come before me. And some of, some of us, I know in situations that we're going through, there's, there's can be more kind of, um, there can be, um, metaphorical giants that are that we're facing, different situations in our life, different hardships that we're facing. But when I think about this story, I think that I identify with a totally different character than David. And maybe some people in this room are also identifying with a totally different character than David. We love identifying with David, because David goes out and kills a giant. He like slays the head. He's like this champion. He gets the reward. He gets the he gets the wealth. He gets the woman. He gets the kingdom. He gets everything, right? Let's be honest. Sometimes in life situations, we're actually not in the position of David, this brave. God's got my back. I'm going to do this. We actually find ourselves in the position of the Israelites. Israelites. Let's look at them for a moment. So here's the Israelites, the people of God, that have seen God come through in battle before. They, they have watched Him provide for them. They, they're this amazing people who, who have seen the provision of God in their lives, has, has seen all these things. And then, in this moment, they face Goliath, this champion. And what are they all? They're all terrified and afraid of what's going to happen. And I find myself sometimes in that, in that situation. I, I've got something going on in my life, or, or things are coming at me, and though I can look back and say, okay, God has done these things, He's with me, He's, I've seen Him move in my life, and all of a sudden, the next, the next thing comes up, right? And then I am immediately in this place of terrified, this place of, oh my goodness, what, what's going on? How can I do this? What's going to overcome? Even though I, as much gusto as I try to get to go into this situation, I'm still in my own strength. I just, I just can't do it. You know, outside I may look like everything is going okay. I, I try to get that way. I look okay to everybody. I don't let people in and let them know what's going on. But inside I'm just like, this situation is, is terrible. Or I'm on the other side of things. I'm like, okay, I'm going to try to do, do it on my own. And I won't let anybody else know what's going on in my weaknesses and with things, the giants that are in my land, because, hey, uh, I don't want to look like, like things are going on. So the Israelites here at this moment are really more what I look like. This is where I think when I start to understand, I'm actually in the, in the point of the Israelites, that, that David and Jesus being the son of David begin to look so much more glorious. Because it demonstrates for me what Jesus did in my life in this one simple story. Jesus, from a humble beginning, born of a virgin, laid in a manger, I said in uh, the last verse in Matthew chapter 1 that he grew in wisdom and strength. goes to the point of dying on the cross, putting his life for my place, establishing a new covenant with me, 
and then giving me all of his kingdom, all of his riches, putting us in a position in the kingdom where we are now sons and daughters of the Most High God. Now look at this David, when he goes up against this giant, he takes just a sling and a stone, and he hits him right in the forehead. Then the people of Israel rejoice, they're like, oh awesome, we got the, the, the champions dead. But then what, what happens after that? And there's this one verse I, I underlined in my Bible. In verse 53, 1 Samuel chapter 17, <coughs> verse 53, right after the, the champion had died, the Philistine champion died, David killed him, cuts off his head. The, the Philistines now are afraid if this little shepherd boy can beat our champion, what can the rest of the army do? And they start running. The Israelites start going after them. In verse 53, when the Israelites returned from chasing the Philistines, they plundered their camp. How would I encourage that? I, I see Jesus do the same thing for me and for you. We're celebrating the Christmas season a season of, of giving, a season of receiving. Jesus, the picture of him as the son of David, is this one that he went from humble beginnings to champion of the world when he went on the cross and he rose again for our life and giving us eternal life, giving us gifts and giving us position that we never deserve and never earn. David here, the, the people of Israel, never earning anything, never actually being ones terrified and not even willing to go and fight in one moment to the next moment, seeing David slay the giant and them now receiving the plunders of all the land. It's a parallel here. That when it comes to Jesus as, as a son of David, we receive what we don't deserve and never earn. It's an amazing moment when we receive what we never earn and never deserve. But Jesus, the son of David, establishes himself as king. He has everything, and he gives us everything. I think uh, for, for us this morning as we are entering into the, the time of, of gift giving, a, a time of receiving, a time of giving, a, Rachel, Rachel loves uh, Christmas time because we get to give away, oh, she likes that, have anybody ever taken the, the five love language tests? Yeah. The way people express love, yeah. Words of affirmation. No, okay. So there's five love. Okay, so this wasn't what I was about to say. This. All right, we've got five, five love languages. The ways that people express love to one another um, and and receive love. So there's words of affirmation. So when people say encouraging things, and when you're when you want to share love with somebody or show how much you appreciate them, you you share with them a, a encouraging word. And secondly, you you have physical touch. And, that's if oh, you're just a hugger, and I, I like to hug, I'm like a hugger, and that's how I receive, or I show love, or I show like affirmation of people, I'll tap them on the shoulder, things like that. So then we have giving gifts, that was, uh, and this is the way that you share or express love, you can share love by giving gifts and, and receiving gifts, and um, like I was mentioning, Rachel's, that's Rachel's the gift, she loves to receive gifts or, or give gifts, Some, sometimes actually, that's totally not what I was going to say. But uh, anyway, so, sometimes um, when, our, when we were early in our, our marriage, I didn't know that Rachel was trying to tell me that she loved me by the gifts that she was giving me. <laughs> um, some people have heard this story in the room. But so every, once, every, every time Rachel would go to the store, we'd go grocery shopping or different situations. Any time, maybe we'd go, go to the gas station, pump gas, or she would go in, you know, she would come back and she would give me a candy bar. 
And I was like, and I'm not, a, I'm not like them. I don't love candy bars, but you know, I eat them every once in a while. So every time she would come home, she would like, hey, Andrew, I, I got you something today. And she'll bring me, she'll bring me a Snickers or something. And I pick the Snickers, oh, thank you for giving me the Snickers. I'll, and I put it on, uh, we have this rack in our kitchen, so I put it on the rack. Maybe a week would go by, or two weeks would go by, and I hadn't eaten the Snickers bar yet. And, and then she would remind me, hey, Andrew, I guess it's a Snickers bar. <laughs> I got this for you, and I was like, okay, thanks, you know, I'll eat it when I'm, you know, when I'll eat it when I want it, or, you know, I'll eat it at that moment, you get to sweet craving or whatever, and um, she would do this all the time, and then eventually, we read this book, it's called Five Love Languages, and we're like, oh, I was like, I don't know, I had one of those moments you can finally figure out things, you know, I don't know, sometimes for me, I'm a little slower at this or something, and I, like, Rachel, you've been trying to tell me you love me for seven years, and I had no idea. I had no, yeah, she would give me a gift every time she'd go somewhere, and I was like, ah, that's what it is. So now I'm going to, I'll, I'll buy a little something and bring it home when I'm, when I'm talking. Anyway, <laughs> love language. Where did I go? Love languages, giving gifts. What are the other two? Uh, there's um, acts, of, acts of service. Uh, so, when, so if you're telling somebody you love them, or you you want to tell somebody you love them, you're, you're doing something for them. So I tend to be that way. I'll clean up the house and I'll be like, hey, Rachel, look at the house. It's so wonderful. You know, and that's my way of saying, hey, I love you. I'm doing this for you. Or, or doing these little, little tasks. And it's like, well, I don't receive love that way. So I got to learn. I got to learn how to love Rachel and her love language. You get to learn how to, how to love me in that way. And there's one last one. Time. Quality, quality time. I just want to sit next to you and I don't care what we do, we just want to, want to be together. I like that. So Jesus. Um, <laughs> yes. Jesus gives a kiss. He's expressing his love to us. So, um, greatest gift. Jesus giving gifts. Jesus plunders it all. So what, is this, what does this practically mean? For us, Jesus being the son of David, this picture of Jesus that we have as the one that, he's the one that fights the battle for us. He goes, he slays the giant for us. He goes, he, if we get all a reward from the plunder of the war. He goes to the cross on our behalf, and he, and now we receive this great reward. But now in the here and now, in the situations that we're in, sometimes for us, we need to release what we're going to to him in order that we will get his reward. So we know we can celebrate the birth of this of Jesus, we can celebrate the salvation of Jesus, but as, as we're experiencing it now in the everyday, how does this picture of Jesus encourage me in my situation today? And that's where it becomes this step of faith. Something that David demonstrated compared to any of any anybody else in the Israelite camp was a faith. It was a faith that God was able. God was able to do it. Who was this Philistine that would that would make fun of us, that would defy our God? Do you know who we serve? And David stood up in the, in, the, in the midst of all the people, and the only one that said, no, our God is able to defeat this. He didn't take on, he didn't take on his own, in his, he didn't take on extra power, he didn't take on extra things, he didn't, he didn't do anything else, but he just believed. Some people, when they would, preach about the David and Goliath, they would talk about the significance of the, the smooth stones and they and what they represent. They would talk about the sling and, and how and, and how that would represent different different prayers or or different ways to pray. But I believe with all my heart what the the power that David demonstrated that day was that he believed in God and he didn't uh, take matters in his own hands just try to create anything extra. He just knew, all I need is to be myself, and God is going to take care of the rest. He didn't take on anything extra. I'm going to 
be myself, and God's going to take care of the rest. I don't need anything extra. I don't need the armor of, of Saul. I don't, I don't need to be trained. I don't need to go after it. I don't, I don't need that. All I need to know is that God's got my back. I'm going to go through this. It's the same faith that Jesus demonstrated when he went to the cross to finish his task. The moment in the garden is a super real moment. I mean, like, I, you know, we never know, or we don't know the, the day at a time that our life will end, right? But Jesus was one that he knew what was prophesied. He knew what he was entering into. He knew the betrayal that was about to happen. He knew this moment. But in that moment, he prays a prayer that he says, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. In that prayer is an extreme, is an extreme example of, again, faith in the Father, faith in God. It's out of my control. This situation, situations in life. I just watched a, I watched this YouTube video, this vlog of somebody, and yesterday he visited his friend in the hospital in the vlog, and um, his his friend has cancer, and he's going wrestling through this thing. You know, like there's there's certain things in life we we can't control. And there's certain things we can do to, as far as health goes to, to improve our health, but we, there's certain things we just we can't control what will happen. We can't always control certain job situations. We can't always control what health situations we're in. We can't always control life, things that happen. But in the middle of things, when they actually when they happen to us, when health things come our way, when, when hey, I'm this age now, and, and this happened, hasn't happened in my life, or I'm, I'm, this situation is, is <coughs> so real to me now, and I don't know what to do. I didn't choose this, or maybe I did choose this, and this is now the situation I'm in. What do we do in that moment? What do we do in the moment that we're about to head to the cross, as Jesus said? What do we do in the moment where there's, a, there's some, somebody in front of us defying our God, telling us the word of uh, that, that he's a liar. Or we know today we have, that today, yesterday, forever, we have, a, we have an enemy of our soul who only speaks lies and will lie to us about our situations, our circumstances. What do we do in that moment? Sometimes we can't do anything. It requires us to have a faith that God is able. I have a uh, a leader of a ministry that I was involved in, he would say, he would say it this way, you, that you, sometimes you have to just know in your knower that God has got this. And be determined to walk through to see his victory at the very end. This morning I wanted to encourage us as we look at Jesus' this picture of Jesus, he said, Son of David. When we look at the story of David and Goliath, we see that that Jesus was one just like David. He he had faith in God. He knew he was going to come through with victory on the other side. And everything that he did was not for his own sake, but was for the sake of others, that we would receive the greatest gift. That today we can stand in faith, believing and knowing that he's going to get us through whatever Goliath type situation we're in. We don't have to do it on our own. We put our faith in Him. And as a family, we're going to agree together that He's going to come through on our behalf. This morning, why don't we bow our heads and pray? And I believe that God is going to come through. Jesus is going to come through. And if anything, you can hear that this morning, that this picture of Jesus is that He is the one that wins the battle on our behalf. We don't have to fight anymore. He'll fight for us. And we'll get the reward. That's right. Father, this morning we recognize that there is a a real battle going on today. And it's a battle for our souls. The enemy would want nothing more than to, to kill.
kill, steal, and destroy. Our lives, our faith, our families, our health. This morning, if we pause as we are celebrating the birth of our Savior, Jesus, we recognize that, Jesus, you are the one that fights for us. You fight on our behalf. You're the son of David who established, who established his kingdom forever. In this moment, we take a moment to pause and to remember that it is you that fight for us. There's nothing we can do in our own strength. However, when we put our faith in you, there's nothing that is impossible. There's nothing that is impossible with you. Father, I pray now in Jesus' name that you would release deliverance in our homes, in our families, in our places of work, in our health, that we receive the champion's reward, we receive the rewards of your suffering, that we would receive out of the plunder, we would receive out of all that you have for us. Father, I thank you now in the name of Jesus that there is going to be freedom that reigns in our homes and in our hearts. It's Jesus, you've come and you've won the victory for us. We thank you for this in the name of Jesus. Amen.